Well, it's, it's painful to understand how much of what you're doing isn't productive. So I'll give you an example. So I've done this a couple of times with classrooms full of students. Usually when I'm lecturing about career development, say, okay, um, how much time do you waste? So then I get the class to vote. How many of you waste uh, 10 hours a day? It's like 10% of the kids will put up their hands. And it's interesting because I don't define what constitutes waste. I just ask the question. So they're diagnosing themselves, right? I'm not saying you're wasting 10 hours a day. I'm just asking. It's like, given your own attitude, how much time are you wasting? 10 hours a day. It's like 10% of the people put up their hands. Well, when you get to like six hours a day, 80% of the people put up their hands. So then we do the arithmetic. It's like, because I like doing arithmetic with people. People hate arithmetic, but I like doing it. It's like, okay, six hours a day. It's 42 hours a week. So let's call that a work week, 40 hours a week. So, so that's, that's a work week. Let's say, what's your time worth? You're a university student. Well, it's certainly worth minimum wage, because obviously, but it's worth way more than that, because if you spend a productive hour when you're 20, then you gain the benefits of that hour for the rest of your life. So there's the compounding effect of time spent when you're young. So I say, well, let's assume your time's worth 50 bucks an hour, which I think is an underestimate, but whatever. Let's call it 50. We call it 25, but we'll call it 50. So that's $2,000 a week you're wasting. It's $100,000 a year. It's like, how much better would your life be if you weren't wasting $100,000 a year? It's like, what is that over 40 years? $4 million. It's like, you're rich. You don't even know it. Quit wasting time. By your own definition. It's like people shake their heads. Like, Why never thought about it that way? It's like, yeah, think about it that way. Don't waste your damn life. So, schedule. That's a good thing, man. Your brain will thank you for it. It'll stabilize your nervous system. With a bit of a plan, that's a good thing. You need a career, you need something productive to do with your time. You need to regulate your use of drugs and alcohol. Most particularly alcohol, because that has a lot of people. Um, you need a family, like the family you have, your parents and all that. It'd be nice if you all got along, you work on that, that's good. Then, you know, you probably need children at some point. That's life. That's what life is. And if you're missing, you know, you may have a good reason to not be operating on one of those dimensions. It's not mandatory. But I can tell you that if you're not operating reasonably well on four, I think I mentioned six, if you're not operating reasonably well on at least three of them, there's no way you're going to be psychologically thriving. And that's more pragmatic in some sense than psychological, right? Human beings have a nature, there's things we need. And if we have them, well, that's good. And if we don't have them, well, then we feel the lack. You need a broad scale vision. You have to know what it is that you're doing with your life, let's say, generally speaking, but more particularly in the next three to five years. What do you want? You know, what would you want from your friendships? What would you want from your intimate relationship? How would you like to structure your family? What do you want for your career? Well, how are you going to use your time outside of your job? And how are you going to regulate your mental, physical, mental and physical health? And maybe also your drug and alcohol use, because that's, that's a good place to auger down, you know, because alcoholism, for example, wipes out you know, five to 10% of people. So you want to keep that under control. And then, and then, so maybe, you know, you, you, you develop a vision of what your life, what you would like your life to be. And that associates the, so the goal, well, once the goal is established and then you break down the goal into micro processes that you can implement, the micro processes become rewarding in proportion, in relation to their, uh, causal association with the goal and that tangles in your your incentive reward system you know we talked about the dopaminergic incentive reward system and that's the thing that keeps you moving forward and the way it works is that it works better if it produces positive emotion when it can see you moving towards a valued goal okay well what's the implication of that better have a valued goal because otherwise you can't get any positive motivation working out and so the more valuable the goal in principle the more the micro processes associated with that goal start to take on a positive charge and so what that means is well you get up in the morning and you're excited to, about the day you're ready to go and so as far as I can tell what you do is you specify your long-term ideal you specify your goal you, you do that you do that 
in some sense as a unique individual you want to you want to specify goals that make you say oh if that could happen as a consequence of my efforts it would clearly be worthwhile because the question always is why do something because doing nothing is easy you just sit there and you don't do anything that's real easy the question is why would you ever do anything and the answer to that has to be because you've determined by some means that it's worthwhile and then the next question might be, well, where should you look for worthwhile things? And one would be, well, you could consult your own temperament. And the other would be, well, you kind of look at how, look at what it is that people accrue that's valuable across the lifespan. Look, look what, so you do a structural analysis of the subcomponents of human existence and already did that. You need a family, you need friends. Like you don't need to have all these things, but you better have most of them. Family, friends, career, educational goals, plans for, you know, time outside of work, uh, attention to your mental and physical health, etc. You know, those are that's what life is about. And if you don't have any of those things, well, then all you've got left is misery and suffering. So that's that's a bad that's a bad deal for you. So so once you, but once you set up that, that goal structure, let's say, and that's really, in many, in many ways, that's what you should be doing at university. It's, it's, that's exactly what you should be doing, is trying to figure out who it is that you're trying to be, right? And you, you, you aim at that. And then you use everything you learn as a means of building that person that you want to be. And, and I really mean want to be. I don't mean should be, even those things, those things are going to overlap. And it's important to distinguish between those because that's partly, and this is back down to the micro routine analysis. So if I was saying, well, you're going to try to make yourself more industrious. Okay, number one, specify your damn goals because how are you going to hit something if you don't know what it is? That isn't going to happen. And often people won't specify their goals too because they don't like to specify conditions for failure. So if you keep yourself all vague and foggy, which is real easy because that's just a matter of not doing as well, then you don't know when you fail. And people might say, well, I really don't want to know when I fail because that's painful. So I'll, I'll keep myself blind about when I fail. That's fine, except you'll fail all the time then. You just won't know it until you've failed so badly that you're done. And that can easily happen by the time you're 40. So, so I would recommend that you don't let that happen. So that's willful blindness, right? You could have known, but you chose not to. Okay, so once you get your goal structure set up, you think, okay, if I could have this life, looks like that might be worth living, despite the fact that it's going to be, you know, anxiety provoking and threatening and there's going to be some suffering and loss involved in all of that. Obviously, the goal is to, to have a vision for your life such that all things considered, that justifies your effort. Okay, so then what do you do? Well, then, then you turn down to the micro routines. It's like, okay, well, this is what I'm aiming for. How does that instantiate itself day to day, week to week, month to month? And that's where something like a schedule can be unbelievably useful. Google Calendar. It's like, make a damn schedule and stick to it. Okay, so what's the rule with the schedule? It's not a bloody prison. That's the first thing that people do wrong. They say, well, I don't like to have, follow a schedule. Well, it's like, well, what kind of schedule are you setting up? Well, I, sh I have to do this, then I have to do this, then I have to do this. You know, and then I just go play video games because who wants to do all these things that I have to do? It's like, wrong. Set the damn schedule up so that you have the day you want. That's the trick. It's like, okay, I've got tomorrow. If I was going to set it up so it was the best possible day I could have, practically speaking, what would it look like? Well, then you schedule that. And when you do something new, you use almost your whole brain. That's a good way of thinking about it, particularly the right side of it, the right hemisphere. And as you practice something, the amount of your brain you use gets smaller and smaller until and moves leftward until you basically build a effective little machine at the back that takes care of it automatically. Routinizing things decreases the cognitive and physiological load. It's a big deal. And if you routinize good habits, then they become part of your character. Please subscribe for more videos.